Hi, uh, my name is Matt Harding, and I have a logo. <laughs> Do you have a logo? I didn't think so. I have a logo. Um, so I, uh, I'm, I travel around the world dancing badly. That's my job. Um, this is a map of all the places in the world that I've danced so far. Um, I look at this, and I, I, I know what you're probably thinking right now is, what do you have against Chad, right, right there in Africa? I look at it, and I just see the places I haven't been to yet. I don't have anything against Chad. I'm sure it's wonderful. I just haven't been. But uh, this is actually a lot of places. It's over 100 countries on all seven continents. Uh, and I'm proud to say that I got to most of those places with somebody else paying for it. Um, <laughs> this started uh, 10 years ago. This is me in June of 2003, the first time I ever danced badly and filmed it. Um, I get asked, surprisingly, surprisingly often, if I planned this all out from the beginning, if this was some big idea and it was, I knew what it was going to do. And I assure you that the guy in this photo had no idea that his life was being profoundly altered in, in this moment. This did not seem like a million dollar idea at the time. Um, I, uh, I just quit my job. I, uh, as he said in the introduction, I was working as a video game designer in Australia. Um, I was lucky enough to start doing that at a very young age, 19, uh, and I did it for seven years and suddenly realized around 26 that I wasn't very good at it and uh, I didn't like doing it very much and there was probably something else that I would like doing more, but I had no idea what it was. So I quit my job and uh, I grew up in the US in, in Connecticut and we didn't have the kind of culture of travel that they had in Australia, where, I, where I'd been living. Uh, when I was growing up and we'd go on trips, we'd go to Disney World or we'd go to the Caribbean. Uh, but when I went to Australia, I discovered this whole other culture of travel where they don't do what Americans do when we go on vacation and say, all right, how much of New Zealand can I see in three days? Australians go and they, they'll spend a year or two years and they don't worry about money. They'll figure it out when they get there. They just go. And that sounded amazing to me. Uh, and it sounded like what I wanted to do. I didn't know how I was going to make a living at it, but I wanted to do it. So I quit my job, and I took the money that I'd saved as a game designer and did a six-month backpacking trip around the world. No big plan there. I was just going to see as many places as I could in, until the money ran out. Um, but I bought this thing called a digital camera, and they'd just come out on the market in 2003. How many of you guys right now have something in your pocket that can shoot video? Raise your hand. Okay, right, yeah. How many of you carried something around in your pocket that shot video 10 years ago? One, all right, you and me. I just bought this, this digital camera and it had a video mode. I could shoot video. Up until then, you'd have to lug around a big camera if you wanted to shoot. And if you were on a backpacking trip, you probably weren't gonna do that. So I had this way of shooting video in strange and exotic places. And there's this thing called the Matthew Principle. There are advantages conferred on people who are lucky enough to do something first. Huge advantages. Even if the thing you're doing first is dancing like an idiot in a strange place. So when I was in uh, Hanoi with my friend, he said, why don't you go stand over there on the curb and do that stupid dance you do? It wasn't my idea even. It was his idea. He said, go stand there and dance. I said, okay. I went and did this dance that I used to do at work when it was time to go to lunch. I'd stand over people's desks and go like this <laughs> until they got so annoyed that they'd get up and go to lunch with me. So <laughs> he recorded me doing it. And I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. It's, it's better than just standing in front of a statue and smiling, uh, which just sucks all the life out of everything. I'm doing a dance, and I'll just keep on doing this everywhere I go. I'll do this little dance, and I'll put it all together at the end. And it'll be a fun memento for me to look back on the places I went to. I didn't think it would be interesting to anyone else. Um, and it really wasn't to my friends. I'd show it to my friends, and they'd say, OK, great, whatever. <laughs> but I put it on my website, and uh, it sat there for a couple of years. Still, no one looked at it. But in 2005, uh, somebody sent me an email and told me about this website called YouTube. And <laughs> YouTube, you probably know about now, uh, is this site where people upload videos. And I found my video that somebody else had uploaded. And it had been watched over 600,000 times, uh, which was a lot back then. And uh, the funny thing about this is the person who'd uploaded it had also, in the details on the side, written uh, a PayPal account in my name, matt.harding at paypal.com, and was asking people to donate money to him so he could keep on traveling. So I tracked this guy down. Um, I said, I don't know who you are, but you're not me. Uh, please don't ask people for money in my name. Uh, it turned out it was a 16-year-old kid, and he wrote back to me, and he said, I've collected $235 so far. I'd be willing to cut you in on 5% of it. Uh, 
So, <laughs> so this was a very strange time for me, as you can imagine, and I thought that was really interesting. Uh, other people found meaning in the video that I didn't know was there and certainly didn't deliberately put in there. There was something being expressed by the dancing that made people really, really happy. And, and it, it seemed to summarize how people felt or wanted to feel when they traveled. Um, I didn't know what to do with that. I, I, I thought, wow, maybe I can get to keep on traveling this way. But that was as far as I'd thought. Uh, and I didn't know how to turn the success of this video into someone coming along and saying, hey, you know, go travel. But fortunately, I didn't have to. I got contacted, just as this was all exploding in 2005, by a company called Cadbury Adams, which is now owned by Kraft. Uh, and they said, hey, we've got a chewing gum coming out. In a little over six months, we're putting this product on the market called Stride Gum. No one's heard of it yet. We want people to hear of it. Viral videos are a thing now. We don't know how to make one. You made one. Will you make one for us? And I said, well, will you pay for it? And they said, yes. And I said, then sure. <laughs> uh, I traveled out to Parsippany, New Jersey. And, and I thought, man, if these people are going to give me money to travel around the world, I've got to have a plan. So I went and I got the biggest National Geographic political map of the world that I could find. It was huge. And I rolled it up and I drew all these dotted lines like Indiana Jones, showing, showing the whole route that I was going to take around the world in six months, all the places I was going to hit, the kind of footage I was going to get. I laid it all out in their conference table, explained to them what I was going to do, and God bless them, they, they made it clear that they really didn't care. They, they, <laughs> It didn't matter to them where I went. Uh, they just wanted a video that a lot of people were going to watch. And they were going to trust in me that I was going to make it. It was a pretty small gamble for them. If it didn't work, no big deal. If it worked, great. So they sent me off, said, see you in six months. They didn't know where I was. They didn't know what I was doing. They just let me go make this video. And the plan that I had going in was, I'm just going to go in front of all these places I've always wanted to see and never thought I'd get to see, and I'm going to do this dance. I'm going to go to uh, the Great Wall of China. I went to Machu Picchu. I went to Easter Island. I went to Antarctica. And I just keep on doing this dance. What did it mean? What was I saying? Were people going to watch it? Who cares? I was going to have the time of my life. And I did. Um, but it did start bothering me as the months went on on this trip that what I was saying was essentially no different from what a dog says when you take him on a walk and he goes and he pees in front of a tree. He's saying, I was here. Uh, I'm standing in front of the Taj Mahal, dancing, I was here. Uh, and that's it's not very interesting. But fortunately, again, I didn't have to figure it out. Uh, the solution presented, to me, to, presented itself to me in, uh, in Rwanda. I didn't have a lot of uh, stops in Africa planned. I didn't have a lot of places I knew of that I could dance in front of. But I did have a friend who was working for an NGO in Rwanda. And uh, so I decided to go visit him and, and try and get a shot in Rwanda. Now, if you know anything about Rwanda's history, you know there aren't a lot of famous landmarks there that you'd want to dance in front of. Uh, but there are a lot of people. Rwanda is one of the most densely populated countries in Africa. So I just decided that I was going to dance in front of, da dance with some people, some kids. Kids are easier to dance with than, than adults, no offense. Um, so my friend took me out to this village called Malindi. There were a bunch of kids playing next to a puddle. And I walked up to them, and I started dancing. I didn't speak, I don't speak Kenya Rwandan, and I don't speak French, and they didn't speak English, but it didn't matter. I started dancing, and they immediately started dancing with me. And within a few seconds, within about a minute, all the other kids in the village had seen this gigantic white man dancing with a bunch of kids, and they wanted to come and join in too. So I had pretty much every kid in the village standing around dancing, having a blast. And in the six months of travel that I did, it was the best experience I had on the trip, and the best clip that I put in the video. Um, but, uh, but it was kind of too late. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd already made the video by this point when I realized that I'd been doing it wrong. I realized that me dancing by myself is not very interesting. But if I had a lot, whole lot of people dancing with me, that is really interesting. When you go on trips and you take a picture of a sunset, or a mountain, or a tree, or whatever, you look at it afterwards and you go, well, that's kind of boring. You show it to your friends and they're like, they don't really care. What's interesting is other people. We respond to other people. And when you take a snapshot, like I was talking about earlier, you just kind of stand like this and smile. You suck the life out of it. People are interested in seeing other people do things. And dancing was a way of bringing that out. It's not about the dance. It's about the smiles on people's faces when they're doing the dance. And they feel embarrassed and ridiculous and silly. But the walls come down. They open up. And so I'd stumbled into this really amazing way of showing that people are, are, are the same everywhere you go. Uh, but it was too late. I'd already done the video. So I put it up on YouTube. 
it did really well. 10 million people watched it. And uh, it was great. I had a lot of fun with that. But I went back to Stride afterwards and I said, hey guys, thank you for sending me on this trip. I did it wrong. You need to send me around the world again <laughs> to make another one. And this time I'm gonna get people to dance with me. And the last one worked out pretty well. So they said, sure, okay. Uh, and I got to make the 2008 video. Now again, there's the problem of, okay, you have this idea, you wanna get people to dance with you. How do you actually do that? Once again, I didn't need to find the solution. It presented itself to me. 10 million people had watched this video. I had about 10 million emails in my inbox saying, hey, you forgot to dance in my country. You forgot to dance in Sweden. You forgot to dance in Israel. You forgot to dance in South Korea. You forgot to dance in Austria. You gotta come here and dance with me. So I had all these people begging me to come dance with them. And I kept them all. And I put them into folders by country. And uh, so I, we just, that's how we did the next video. I'd say, all right, I'm coming to Munich. I'm gonna dance in the English gardens. Meet me here at this time. And lo and behold, every time I went anywhere, there was a huge crowd of people. I never, I avoided interviews, media at all costs. I didn't want mobs of people showing up who didn't really know what it was. I wanted people who got it and understood what they were gonna be a part of and were really engaged. They could tell their friends, but I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna just put it out there because I was really just me and my girlfriend with a tripod and I can't handle huge crowds of people anyway. So that's how we did the 2008 video. Uh, oh. I forgot this part. So yeah, I also discovered this other thing that worked really well. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a really bad dancer. I'm not actually very good at it at all, but that's actually an advantage when you're trying to get people to dance with you. Because if I was really good at it, if you saw me dancing like Fred Astaire, you would not come over and dance with me. But I was setting the barrier for entry really, really low. Because you watch me dance and you go, I am not going to dance worse than that guy. So it became an advantage. And that's how I made the 2008 video. How many of you guys have seen the 2008 video? Okay, about half of you guys. Well, it did really well. Uh, it got over 40 million views. Uh, somebody sent me a picture of the president watching it, uh, which I'm not gonna put up here, but it's a really cool picture. Uh, and, uh, and it got to the point where if you, if you pull out your phone right now and you go to Google and you type in M-A-T-T, -T, Matt, first thing that's gonna come up is this damn video. Uh, I don't know how. I don't know how that works. Somebody up there at Google likes me. Um, still to this day, you Google Matt, you get this video. Um, so I, I, I felt like, okay, after five years of plugging, yeah, five years had gone by, by the way. After five years of doing this, I'd finally got it right. This is, this is what I'm trying to say, but there was still this thing nagging me in the back of my head that I, I didn't really get to do the thing. Oh, I should explain one other thing. After this video came out, yeah, 40 million views, so didn't so much have to worry about money anymore. Uh, the Stride thing worked out very well for me, and then all these other endorsement things came along. If, you're, if you go to Japan right now and turn on a TV, you're gonna see me holding a Visa card going, Visa de Natsu Yasumi. <laughs> so things turned out very well for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, bought a house, started a family, didn't need to worry so much about cash anymore. It was great. Um, but this thing was still bothering me that, uh, that I'd learned in traveling in all these years, which is, uh, which is that the places that I was most afraid of going to, uh, where I thought I'd get, I don't know, spit on, people would threaten me, people would put me into jail, whatever, never happened. None of that ever happened. I'd go to these places like Yemen uh, or, or Saudi Arabia, and people would be friendly and open everywhere I went. And what I hadn't said with the video, I, I almost did, but I didn't quite get there, is that the world is safer and more open than it's ever been. The reason I wasn't able to do that is because I actually had to sign a contract that said I wouldn't go to those countries. I had to sign a thing that said I wouldn't go to North Korea, I wouldn't go to Afghanistan, wouldn't go to Syria, wouldn't go to Lebanon. And it really, really bothered me because those are the best places to go to, to say what I was trying to say. Um, so I wanted to make one more video and I wanted to go to those places. Um, but I knew that was gonna be a tough sell with any sponsor because they were gonna make me sign a contract that said I wouldn't go there for various corporate reasons that I don't really understand and can't explain. Uh, so I decided to take all this visa de Natsu Yasumi money and spend it on funding my own video. Um, I wasn't gonna try and fund the whole thing, mind you. I was just gonna start it. And I figured once I'd gone to North Korea and Afghanistan and gotten all these hard places out of the way, they couldn't say no to me anymore. So then I would take it to a sponsor and get them to fund the rest of the video and everything would be fine. So I, I did the first part of the travel and then I started trying to shop it around and I discovered a couple things. One, I'm a terrible salesperson. Uh, two, uh, if you're trying to market a product, telling people they don't need to be afraid is, is kind of the last thing you want to do. Fear's a really good motivator. 
And telling people they don't need to be afraid is not a good way to sell a product. So I had a really bad message uh, for, for most brands uh, to, to try and get on board with. And I had a really hard time selling the video. And I was stuck because uh, I'd already started making it. Uh, so what I ended up doing was, was finishing the video uh, on, my, on my own and self-funding it and hoping for the best. Fortunately, when one thing kind of fades away, it, it was a lot harder by 2010, 2011 to get this sort of internet money that people would throw at you. Because in 2006, nobody understood it. By 2010, 2011, marketing had completely reoriented itself. And they already had the budgets worked out and they already had their social media gurus and their viral marketing gurus. Everybody was acting like they understood it now. And so when I went into these places, I was kind of more of a threat, whereas before I was a solution. So that kind of faded away. But what, what's come in its place, thankfully, is Google now does uh, uh, monetization. You can, you probably all know this, you can post a video on, on YouTube now and you can, get, you can run ads on it and you can get paid for that. And if a whole lot of people watch it, you get a whole lot of money. It's not sponsorship money, mind you, but it's some. And it's better than nothing. So I decided to self-fund the video and uh, I'm going to skip over this slide because I already sort of covered it, and, uh, and put it up. And I just, I'm going to show the video to you, but before I do, I just want to talk about this one uh, clip that you're going to see in North Korea. How many have seen the 2012 video that went out this summer? Hope not very many. Okay, just a few of you. Good. Um, this, is, uh, this is Pyongyang, North Korea. And uh, I really wanted to get a dancing clip there. That was, that was top of the list for me. Um, it's hard to dance with people in North Korea. Uh, it's not prohibited uh, to dance, but it is pretty much prohibited to have interactions as a foreigner with North Koreans. Except uh, I knew that uh, Kim Jong-il's birthday has a mass dance celebration in February. So I went there during the mass dance celebration where everybody just pours out onto the street and they do these gigantic dances. It turned out it was Kim Jong-il's last birthday in 2011. Um, and I went there and I watched it. And uh, people ask me how I got into North Korea. It's not hard at all. All of you can go. As long as you're not a journalist, you can go to North Korea. Um, or just tell them you're not a journalist and then you can go. And uh, they're happy to have you, but yeah, you're, you have North Korean tour guides with you the whole time, and they are going to corral you and make sure you aren't able to strike up a conversation with North Koreans. And if you don't speak Korean, you're not going to be able to anyway, because they certainly don't speak English. Um, so there's sort of a big wall between you and the North Korean people, and that was a problem for me, uh, because I needed to be dancing with them to have a clip. So I went to this mass dance celebration. Everybody's out there doing the dance, and I, and I stood there on the sidelines watching and I, I was learning their dances, you know, this, this, da 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 So that hopefully I could go up with them and, and do it afterwards. Uh, and I memorized the dance, and I talked to the North Korean guides afterwards. I said, I'm, I'm coming here to dance with people during the math, mass dance. You understand that, right? I'm going to go out there and dance with them. And they would kind of smile and laugh and, and nod and laugh. And, and I learned afterwards uh, that when a North Korean... Uh, smiles and laughs at you, it's not because they think you're funny, it's because you're making them very uncomfortable. Uh, so, <laughs> so I was making my North Korean guides very uncomfortable with this request, and they just kind of smiled and laughed. And when it came time to do it, the mass dance was going on, it ended, everybody was started walking away. I said, okay, I'm going to go in there and dance now. They smiled and laughed and said, okay, get on the bus. Get on the bus right now. Uh, so I was kind of freaking out. I'd, this was the whole purpose of the video. I'd come all the way out there to do this. I looked over at our British guides. So you have North Korean guides who come with you, and then you have one sort of uh, uh, on your side. You have, a, you have a British guide with you. He knew what I was there to do. He'd seen the video. He looked at me, and he silently mouthed the word, go. Uh, so I grabbed my camera, and I ran uh, out of my tour group into the crowd of North Koreans that were walking away. They saw me charging toward them. Uh, there were, I, I don't want to call them police. Uh, they weren't military, but they were just kind of party members in uniform all around. I don't know what they are. Security. The security all around, and they saw me coming, and I, and I ran into the crowd, and I plopped the camera down, and I hit record, and I just started dancing. And I, I didn't really have a plan beyond that. I was just going to start dancing, which I've learned is a great metaphor for my life. Um, I just started dancing. I didn't know where I was going to go, but I hoped it would sort itself out. And when I did, all these people you see in the background started cracking up. They were howling. They were laughing hysterically. And what that laughter seemed to do was short circuit the whole security apparatus. Nobody knew what to do. All these guards were standing around, but nobody was going to go near me as long as I kept on dancing and as long as the crowd kept on laughing. But we were kind of at a stalemate because I didn't have a clip. If I didn't get somebody to dance with me, I couldn't use it. 
Uh, so I just kept on doing this, this weird little North Korean dance over and over again. They kept on laughing, and I kept on kind of going like this, come on, somebody, please, please, please come out and dance with me, and they wouldn't. But finally, this one woman who you see here on the right, she stepped out of the crowd, and she bowed down to me and faced me and started mimicking what I was doing and dancing with me. And, uh, and that's it. I got my clip, and you're going to see it in the video, but I wanted you to know that story before you watch it, because that's the whole thing right there. That's, that six seconds is, is everything. The courage of this one woman to step out of a crowd in North Korea. I mean, I hope you all know what that means or have some idea of what that means to be a North Korean and to step out of a crowd in front of everybody and dance with an American. Um, so her courage right there in, in that moment is the whole video for me, and, uh, and that's what I wanted to say. I, after making the 2008 video, I thought, you know, if I had f the attention of 40 million people and I could say one thing to them, what is it? And it's that, it's right there. It's we don't, we don't need to be afraid of each other. Um, so I'm gonna show you the video now. I hope you like it, uh, but before it comes on, I also wanna say, uh, a lot of people ask me this, will you dance with me and can I record it? Yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna do a Q&A afterwards and then hopefully uh, some of you folks will come up and dance with me on stage. But if you wanna just grab me and put it on your Facebook page, go ahead, I'll be here uh, as long as you will. Happy to dance with you. Okay, so here is the video. Can we cue up the video? Once by 